Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Good evening and welcome to Cafe Sci, as we call it, Cafe Scientifique Silicon Valley at SRI International, its full name. I'm Marty Ritchie. I work here in the Corporate and Marketing Communications Group. I um, want to let you know we're videotaping tonight's event and we'll post it to SRI's YouTube channel where you can find many videos from past events. So pick up a blue bookmark as you head out. It has the address for our YouTube channel and other social media addresses for us. Um, I'd like to tell you quickly about next month's event. Um, we are actually going to have on Tuesday, October 8th, uh, the robotics teams from Palo Alto High School and Menlo Atherton High School. They're <laughs> it's going to be really cool. Um, they're going to demonstrate their robots and show us how they build and compete with them at robotics competitions. So it's probably going to be a crowded event. Lots of parents will be in the audience, I have a feeling. Uh, so please join us then on Tuesday, October 8th, to meet some of the roboticists of the future. So tonight, we're exploring another very interesting area of science. We're in the midst of a revolution in biology where genomes can now be readily characterized and mapped. With new understanding about our genes, scientists can learn more about human, how humans evolved, how species adapt to new environments, and how patients react to drugs, to name just a few examples. Dr. Michael Snyder, a renowned genomicist, is a professor at Stanford University and the chair of genetics at its Center for Genomics and Personalized Medicine. Dr. Snyder's lab was the first to perform a large-scale functional genomics project of any organism. They have launched many technologies for the study of genomics and proteomics. And as you may have heard in the news, Dr. Snyder sequenced his own genome a few years ago to examine the links between his DNA and the biochemical fluctuations in his body over time. Doing this changed his life. His genome sequence revealed his risk for type 2 diabetes. When he was later diagnosed with the disorder, he was ready for it. Tonight, Dr. Snyder will discuss some of the big questions. Is the age of personal genome sequencing here? What does it mean for personalized medicine? And what does the future look like? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Snyder to the podium. All right, well, thanks very much for having me here. It's uh, quite a pleasure. I'm told I didn't realize that Obama's speaking now, so I'm Glad you favored me over. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. So um, anyway, it really is a pleasure to be here. I am dealing with a topic that many of you may have thought about and certainly will think about probably a lot in the, in the, in the near future if you haven't already. Uh, and it, it is this question about getting your genome sequenced. And just out of curiosity, how many of you want to get your genome sequenced? Quite a few. How many don't want to get your genome sequenced? A minority. You know, it wasn't long ago, it was about 50-50, and it, it does seem like more want to. Now, mind you, I'm sure there's a very biased crowd. I'll tell you, usually it's either 50-50 or a little more towards uh, wanting to get their genome sequence, except the one exception I have is when I gave a lecture at the, the Stanford Law School, and there was 90% did not want to get their genome sequence because very risk-adverse crowd, I guess. All right. Anyway, just to put this in perspective, this is at least the way we're thinking about this. Um, which is, if you think about your health, you can really think about it in very simplistic terms that we all know about, which is your health, and I like to refer to as your health state, if you will. It's really a product of your DNA and the environment you're in, the food you eat, uh, viruses and other pathogens you might be exposed to, you know, various life encounters and stresses and things. And, and together, these really do dictate your health state. And I think we all know this intuitively, but I would argue the goal of us as scientists, at least many of us, is to understand this in a very quantitative fashion, to be predictive about this. That is, knowing exactly what's in your DNA, knowing exactly what you're exposed to, you can make some probabilistic outcomes as to what might happen to your health and therefore be able to adjust your behavior. That, that would be the goal. And in many respects, this has been foreshadowed, this concept, quite some time ago and certainly popularized at some level. In this movie, many of you may have seen Gothica. I don't know how many of you have seen this movie. A yeah, fair number. So it's a very interesting movie, and uh, I saw it again recently. I saw it when it first came out. I saw it again recently. It's, a, it's about a person who wants to be an astronaut, and he, you know, his DNA says he shouldn't be, and, uh, but he overcomes odds and does all these things. I mean, he shoots off and lets you watch what I say. Um, anyway, he, it, it's about his DNA and its impact on his life. And Actually, I saw it again recently, and many concepts presented in that movie are actually still quite relevant today, I would argue. And they're very, very real issues. And, and I think what you'll hear from today's talk is uh, um, 
my personal experience about sequencing my DNA, uh, some of the challenges that are involved, how do you do it, and what are the challenges, and then, uh, you know, what does it mean? And so if you are thinking about your getting your genome sequence or not getting your genome sequence, this, um, <clears throat> you can at least see how I dealt with some of the issues as I went along in this journey. So um, anyway, on this equation, I would argue, by the way, that this top part is now approachable. You can sequence your genome and you can determine the exact order of the six billion bases. And I'll uh, give you a little background in just a minute. This part of the equation is still much tougher to deal with, although I think it's something I would argue that we should be working on much harder to try and figure this out. Now this part is approachable because not so long ago, starting about 2005, 2006, some new technologies were uh, introduced that basically reduced the cost of DNA sequencing very rapidly. Uh, and in fact, the cost of sequencing has dropped about tenfold every 15 months or so. There's been a mini plateau in the last year, not a complete plateau. Uh, but nonetheless, there are new technologies that are coming out. And it's now at the point, as we'll talk in a minute, where it now costs about $3,000 to sequence a human genome. So it is very affordable, and it's on its way to $1,000 probably sometime, if not the end of this year, probably next year, it'll hit that goal. And so the question isn't, can you get your genome sequence? It's whether you want to get your genome sequence. And again, what are some of the challenges? So what I want to do is give you a little bit of background about um, genomes and how they vary amongst people so that you can understand what it means to get your genome sequence. I want to talk about the impact of genomics on treating disease, but I really want to talk about this part, the impact of genomics and sequencing genome on healthy people and what does it mean to you. So I've been throwing out a fair amount of jargon, but just to put this in perspective, you probably know that you have a total of 46 chromosomes, 23 from your mom, 23 from your dad, and together that is your genome. It's a collection of all your DNA. And so this collection of, of these different chromosomes, they basically carry all our DNA, and it's a total of 6 billion letters, if you will, 6 billion chemical bases, they're called. And sequencing your genome means determining the exact order of those bases for most of the 6 billion. There's some problematic regions you can't get at. Uh, and um, for the most part, they're ignored now, mostly for technical reasons, not because they're not important. Um, and so what happens is when you get your genome sequence, what you're trying to do is understand differences in the DNA from one person relative to a reference genome or relative to another. And so by way of background, again, we have different kinds of differences in our DNA. So one type, the major form in your DNA are single nucleotide variants or single nucleotide changes. So out of these six billion bases, there'd be one base that's changed. It, you know, one of the four letters has changed to one of the other three. And this actually happens quite a bit. It's about one in every thousand bases or so. So there are about 3.7 million differences between you and the person sitting next to you. Unless, of course, they're your identical twin. Um, in that case, you're almost ident identical in your DNA. Not 100%, but pretty close. Okay? There are also some little short, they're called indels or insertions and deletions on the order of 1 to 100 bases. There's quite a few of these, and the exact number isn't really known. It's somewhere on the order of about 500,000 that will differ between people. And then, believe it or not, there are actually some big chunks of DNA that are different. And there's a fair number of these. There's several thousand of these that are roughly, so say, 3,000 or so, that are around 2,000 bases or so, 2,000 letters long. And these will be either deletions, as shown here, if this is a reference genome, they could either be a, a, a portions deleted or another one's inserted. Usually these are duplications, so the same sequence gets stuck in twice, or they can be inverted. And they're actually, even though there's a few thousand of these, because they're much larger, there's actually a lot more of these bases, these letters that are change and even those single nucleotide variants. So these three kinds of changes are rampant in your genome. Some of these will be a million bases long, by the way. So they can be huge, in fact. And so these three different kinds of variants, if you will, are what makes you different from the person next to you and can lead to propensities for disease and such. Now the way the human genome was sequenced was um, that there were two actually competing groups. There was a a public group that was sequencing away, and there was a private group. But regardless, what was done was to basically determine um, just one copy, not, and it's a, it's a virtual copy, if you will, 
it, it's not a real person. They took DNA from 15 people and put it together in a pool and then determined the sequence roughly of, of a chunk of this for each of the pools. So it's effectively a three billion code. So it's like getting your mom sequenced, uh, one of the copies, one of your chromosomes or your dad's. It's not exactly that because it is a chimera. They wanted to mix it up. So at that time they were worried about this being exactly revealed, getting a little detailed here. But the point is they set up a three billion reference. So you have one reference genome for the sequence. And this was completed in about 2003. It was a huge team of people. It used old fashioned technology. It took 2000 people and it cost somewhere around half a billion to billion dollars. Okay, and again, it uses these machines that would do 384 bits at a time, about a thousand of these bases or so at a time. And so it was a massive effort. It took, um, it was actually completed ahead of time, believe it or not, but it still took roughly, well, once they buckled down in sequence, I'd say about five or six years or so to do this. Now there are these new machines. They do about a trillion of these bases per run, so you can do about 35 genomes at once, so that's like two runs would cover this section of the audience here, okay? And again, it's about $3,000 currently to do this. That's for the sequencing part, by the way. Interpreting that genome costs us about $15,000 or so, so that's, it's not the sequencing anymore. It's how to interpret the, the DNA that's there that's still very time consuming. And it does use very expensive machines, although there are people working on new technologies to bring this price down. But right now, the machines that are most popular cost about $800,000, so it's not cheap to get the equipment. And so just to give you a flavor, so I know this audience is probably a little uneven, but for those of you who are kind of curious how you do this, these machines, what they do is they sequence, uh, they determine about a, a 200 bases at a time. They, they're just itty bitty fragments, but they sequence millions of them at once, actually even a billion or more at, at a time of these, of these fragments. So you get 200 of these bases at once, oops. And so what happens is you, you actually, but they have a high error, so you wanna do it many, many times. So in the end, you actually cover each base about 35 times so you have a confident call that you know what that changes. And so at the end, what you're looking for are cases like this where you might see if this, if there might be, there's a reference genome you're always comparing to, and if you have a change, say a red, a red change there, and it keeps consistently showing up, then you're confident that should be a, a red base, one of those four. Okay, and likewise, because sometimes you have a change in, in your mom's DNA that won't be in your dad's or vice versa, you'll only have one, uh, half the time you'll see the change and the other half you won't. Okay, but you have to sequence enough times to be very confident of that. So the bottom line is you'll generate millions and millions of these reads, you look for these changes, and then you put all that together and that's how you'll deduce your genome sequence. So at the end, again, you'll try and find these 3.7 million single base changes, 500,000 of these short insertions and deletions, and then these several thousand larger changes. That's the goal. And they're always deduced relative to a reference sequence because that's the easiest way to do the technology. Okay, any questions about sort of how it's done? All right, so it now is getting very accessible so that there are lots of people who have had their genome sequence. I used to track this and um, I think they estimated last year something on the order of about 30,000 genomes were sequenced. This year they estimate it's about 300,000 genomes. Most of these are research genomes, but there are some other um, maybe not so researchy genomes. And this is an example of some people who got their genome sequenced. So, uh, you know, one of the first was Jim Watson, the person who came up with the structure of DNA, another uh, sort of famous biochemist. And then, but there's plenty of other people who've gotten their DNA. <laughs> Glenn Close and Ozzy Osbourne and so on. So there's quite a few people now. Okay.